While babies are basically the least intimidating members of society, they can actually be some of the scariest patients to take care of in the operating room because of how quickly serious emergencies can unfold under anesthesia. My name is Max Feinstein, and I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And in this video, I explain why the medications succinylcholine, atropine, and epinephrine are so critical for safely taking care of pediatric patients. Among the many differences between pediatric patients and adult patients is the fact that pediatric patients have a much higher likelihood of a phenomenon where their vocal cords snap shut if there's not a breathing tube that's already in place. This phenomenon is called laryngospasm and can very quickly result in a situation where no oxygen can be delivered to the patient's lungs. One of the major risk factors for laryngospasm is a recent upper respiratory infection. And for that reason, it's not uncommon for pediatric surgeries to be postponed if a child's been sick recently, unless it's an urgent or emergent surgery, in which case there has to be a weighing of the risk versus the benefits of proceeding despite a recent upper respiratory infection. Another major difference between adults and pediatric patients is the fact that pediatric patients can use as much as twice as much oxygen per kilogram of body weight compared to adults which means that if they end up in a situation where they're not able to receive oxygen in their lungs because laryngospasm has occurred, there is much less time to intervene before the patient's oxygen levels start to precipitously decline. For these reasons, it's essential to have a very quick and reliable way to open the vocal cords in the event that laryngospasm occurs. And the way that we do that in pediatric anesthesia is with a rapid-acting paralytic medication called succinylcholine. Succinylcholine can be administered through an IV, but if we don't already have IV access established, then this can also be administered intramuscularly. The major benefit of succinylcholine, and the reason why it's a mainstay for emergency management in pediatric anesthesia, is how rapidly it acts, which is under a minute, usually 45 seconds or sometimes even less when administered IV. In an emergency situation where laryngospasm has occurred and there's no air exchange with the lungs, then having that rapid acting medication is essential for getting oxygen back into the patient's lungs and then into their red blood cells that circulate throughout the body. Despite this major benefit, there are some significant risks that come along with the use of succinylcholine, so we never take it lightly. One of those risks is a very rare condition called malignant hyperthermia, which can be triggered by this medication. In short, malignant hyperthermia is a condition where the muscles in the body start working overdrive and that can cause life-threatening heart problems. I made a video about that, which you can watch by checking out this link right here. Succinylcholine can also lead to similar types of life-threatening cardiac issues in patients who have an undiagnosed muscle condition called muscular dystrophy. One of the other major risks that comes along with the use of succinylcholine is that it commonly will cause a decrease in heart rate especially in younger patients. The reason for that is because the molecule of succinylcholine is made up of two molecules of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a molecule that exists naturally in the body and is partly responsible for decreasing heart rate in a variety of circumstances. So when succinylcholine is administered, it can act in a similar way as acetylcholine, causing a decrease in heart rate. Going back to the differences between pediatrics and adults is the fact that pediatric patients can be very dependent on their heart rate for the amount of cardiac output that they have, meaning how much blood is pumped out of the heart per unit of time. There's actually an equation that we very commonly use to think about this, which is that cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that's ejected every time the heart squeezes. In pediatric patients, the heart actually doesn't have the ability to change size quite as much when it's filling up with blood and then squeezing. So going back to this equation of cardiac output equaling heart rate times stroke volume, the stroke volume is actually fairly fixed in pediatric patients. So their cardiac output then is largely dependent on what their heart rate is. So if there's anything that causes a decrease in heart rate, for example, succinylcholine that's being administered in an emergency, then that can significantly decrease cardiac output, which can, of course, become a life-threatening issue if there's not enough blood going to vital organs, like the coronary arteries of the heart. 
For that reason, another medication that's extremely important for emergency management and pediatric anesthesia is atropine, which is an anticholinergic medication that, among other effects, causes an increase in heart rate. Generally speaking, pediatric patients are at higher risk for having decreased heart rate, or bradycardia, because of the way that their physiology hasn't quite yet developed. In addition to the fact that we might be administering a medication like succinylcholine, which can decrease the heart rate, or performing other interventions like intubation, which also can lead to decreased heart rate. For all of these reasons, it's essential to have atropine ready to go, which can also be administered intramuscularly or through an IV. The third and final medication that I always have available when I'm taking care of pediatric patients is a medication you've probably heard of before called epinephrine. This is in a class of medication called alpha and beta adrenergic agonist, which is basically a fancy way of saying that it will increase blood pressure, increases the heart rate, and increases the contractility of the heart, meaning how much the heart is squeezing. As you can imagine, this is very useful for situations if there's a decreased cardiac output for any reason, like what we've already discussed. Additionally, epinephrine can be used to treat other emergencies that might come up in the operating room, especially a condition called bronchospasm, where the muscles inside of the lung start to close down. When this happens in pediatric patients, this can also lead very quickly to a lack of oxygen in the patient's blood. So epinephrine is a very quick way to remedy this issue. Not to mention, if anaphylaxis occurs, which can also happen in the operating room, especially when medications like antibiotics or paralytics are administered, then epinephrine is going to be the mainstay of treatment. Not only can epinephrine be administered intramuscularly and through an IV, but it can also be administered down an endotracheal tube, which is a really helpful way of treating bronchospasm. But you have to be careful to not administer so much that you make it hard to oxygenate the patient because their lungs are full of epinephrine. Like most of the medications in pediatric anesthesia, all of the ones that I've discussed in this video are dosed based on a patient's weight. So it is vital for anyone who is administering medications to pediatric patients to know exactly what the dose is of succinylcholine and atropine and epinephrine in case it needs to be administered. And in some cases, the doses for these medications varies depending on whether it's delivered through an IV or through an intramuscular needle. One of the more intimidating parts of pharmacology for pediatric anesthesia is the fact that you have to be very aware of the concentration or the dilution of medication that you intend to administer to your patient. A great example is epinephrine. This vial comes with one milligram or 1,000 micrograms in one milliliter. But for a patient who I'm taking care of who weighs two kilograms and I want to administer 10 micrograms per kilogram, which is the appropriate dose if this needs to be administered, then I would want to give 20 micrograms of epinephrine. This vial contains 50 times that amount. So if I were to draw this up without diluting it, I wouldn't even be able to give a single drop without overdosing the patient on epinephrine, which could in itself be a life-threatening condition. For that reason, I commonly will dilute epinephrine down into 100 micrograms per milliliter, as well as 10 micrograms per milliliter, and have both of those dilutions available to me. And if I'm taking the care of very small patients, again, like a two kilogram patient, then I may also have a one microgram per milliliter concentration available, keeping in mind that there are 1,000 micrograms in this one milliliter vial. In order to prepare the dilutions of epinephrine that I want, I start with my one milligram per milliliter vial, double check that it's exactly what I want, and then I've got my syringe prepared for that. I am in the habit of making the syringe extra apparent that this is going to be the highest concentration of epinephrine that I have, which will end up being 100 micrograms per milliliter. Recall that this is currently 1,000 micrograms per milliliter. So the way that I make this dilution is to take sodium chloride and put nine milliliters of that into this syringe.
Then with nine milliliters of sodium chloride, I take one milliliter of full concentration epinephrine. And now this has become 100 micrograms per milliliter. But like I said, I often want to dilute this down even further to 10 micrograms per milliliter, in which case I'll set this syringe aside for a second, take another syringe that is labeled, notice this one does not have red tape on it, so this will be my 10 microgram per milliliter less concentrated syringe. And again, I'm going to drop nine milliliters of sodium chloride So now with nine milliliters of sodium chloride in here, I will make space for one milliliter of additional solution. And that solution that I'll put in will be 100 micrograms per milliliter. But I'll dilute that down. So now this has become 10 micrograms per milliliter. And this is what I typically have available for me anytime I'm taking care of any pediatric patient. But again, if I'm taking care of a very small patient, typically less than five kilograms, then I'll dilute this down by another factor of 10 so that I have one microgram per milliliter syringes available for me. Since I work in a teaching hospital, I often get to work with anesthesia residents who are physicians who are in the process of completing their anesthesia specialty training. And when we're working together, I always make sure that they know off the top of their head the exact dose of succinylcholine, atropine, and epinephrine to be administered for our specific patient based on their weight, both for intramuscular and intravenous dosing. And I emphasize off the top of their head because when an emergency unfolds in the operating room, there is very little time to think, sit, do math, double check exactly what the dose is, and then administer it. It can often just be a matter of seconds that we need to get one of these medications administered. So having that dose available right off the top of your head is vital for taking safe care of pediatric patients. If you enjoyed this video, you might wanna check out this video where I show you exactly what it's like to deal with an intraoperative emergency in the pediatric anesthesia setting. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.